Welcome to our ninth annual Writers' Symposium by the Sea at Point Loma Nazarene University. I'm Dean Nelson on the journalism faculty at the university, and tonight we have two very distinguished authors, distinguished for different reasons. Roy Blunt Jr., we'll get into some of his background here in a, uh, in a moment, and Jim Boughton are both with us for this symposium, and uh, they have written a variety of kinds of books and uh, essays and, and things, uh, all sorts of different types of uh, genres, which I, I want us to explore a little bit tonight. But Roy, let's, let's start with you. You've been described as a literary chameleon. In fact, in fact you may have called yourself that, yeah. Uh, all right, so sports writer. You see what color co chair I'm sitting on. Does That's right, like yeah, pretty soon you're just gonna blend right in. Uh, sports writer, you've been with uh, Sports Illustrated for uh, several years back in the 70s. An essayist, a novelist, screenwriter, love to hear about that, short story writer. You write limericks and poems. Uh, you've written four, in addition to Sports Illustrated, The New Yorker, Esquire, GQ, Rolling Stone, The Atlantic, Men's Journal, National Geographic, there's a mix, 17 books. You just published a, a, a biography on, on Robert E. Lee. Uh, your works are in anthologies all over the place, uh, including the Elvis, uh, the collected works of uh, things written about Elvis. The Elvis Reader or something like the that. The Elvis yeah. Reader, like that, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also uh, anthologies on humor and on baseball. I think th whoever was doing the counting said you've written for 117 different publications. I think it's more than that now. It's up. Yeah. Wow. I'll have, to, I'll have to go back and check. Uh, and you've written regular columns in at least 11 different uh, publications. Frequent guest on Prairie Home Companion and on the television news quiz, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. You're all over the place as a, uh, as a writer. So as a chameleon, when you sit down to write, do you know what's going to happen? Uh, <laughs> Well, I mean, um, I try not to sit down. I have trouble getting anything done, frankly. And, uh, because, of, be, because of all the things that I just listed or for other yeah. reasons that we can help you with tonight? Now, the first answer to the first question, I was going to just say all those things you just said. And yeah, you well. Think I, well, I don't know. You know, I don't know. It's strange writing, but uh, sometimes, I mean, I often think that I just can't do it anymore. And, um, you know, and especially uh, trying to be funny. After the age of, I, I wrote a book called Be Sweet, in which I, that came out several years ago, in which I said that I had reached the age at which people stop being funny. And uh, what age uh, is that? Uh, well, roughly around 55. People, you start getting cranky, and I'm now 60. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jim, could I look at your driver's license just for a moment, Jim? I, according to Roy, I haven't been funny for 10 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've been gone. I'm been unfunny for seven. But so you never know. I don't know. I just like to do different things just for the sake of uh, keeping people uh, off balance and keep, keeping myself off balance. I was going to say, so, so if you sit down, maybe a limerick comes out or maybe a short story comes out or, or are you uh, a little maybe more Maybe nothing comes out. Maybe nothing. Maybe I go out, which is yeah. what I would rather do. I don't know. I, but I, have to, having to do some, telling people I will do things makes me do it. And uh, to write a biography seemed like an, an interesting I don't know. I just get bored with writing. Uh, I get very bored with sitting there by myself. And so if, I, if there's something I have to do that I don't have any idea of how to do, then maybe I can make it interesting for myself. I, I don't like to do the same thing over and over and over. I like to get write my way into trouble and then write my way out. You know? But if I don't get in trouble, I'm really boring. Will you explain that? What do you mean, write your way into well, trouble? Well, I just sort of take a, well, I just did it, I guess. Well, <laughs> so, I mean, just sort of take a bite out of things, just sort of go into something that I don't know anything about. And then I'm, there I am in the middle of it, and I have to figure out, try to work out an excuse for how I got there and, uh, and how I'm going to get through it. You know, just take on a topic, a topic that's, uh, I think that a, a funny writer, you know, should be like a cat in that cats always go and sit in the lap of the one person in the room who doesn't like cats. You know? and, and, you, and you instinctively find, see that lap out there and you go try to sit in it. Because... Figuratively speaking, what, of course. Figuratively speaking. What's right. wrong with cats? I mean, you know, if you're a cat, you think there's something wrong with that person doesn't want me to sit in his, in his lap. 
you have to have that sort of uh, willingness to go to the awkward place and then try to make the awkward thing somehow dance. <laughs> no, you know. Sounds very mystical. It, uh, it is very mystical. I usually, I'm, I'm amazed that I can say anything here without candlelight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, continuing with the seance, Jim. Um, all right, after a successful pitching career with the New York Yankees, you decide to make a comeback and write about it. Actually, talk about it. Because you, you, you took most of your notes just uh, talking into a tape recorder, didn't you? For, uh, uh, for Ball Four? Well, Ball Four I wrote while I was playing ball. Right, and so, but, but you were taking notes and talking into a tape recorder. Yes. You're just, you were just kind of collecting stuff, right? Yeah, I wanted to share the fun of, of baseball. And uh, so, I, I, I mean, I always thought that uh, baseball players were very funny people, uh, you know, mostly unintentionally funny, but um, it was an interesting lifestyle. And, and I thought, I, I, you know, I'd want to remember it. So I, I wrote these things down so that I would remember it and so that I could maybe write a book. I wasn't sure exactly how that would work, but... Um, well, and, and it didn't, uh, there were low expectations. I mean, 5,000 copies were, were printed of... Printed uh, 5,000 copies on the grounds that nobody would want to read a book, uh, you know, about the Seattle Pilots. It was a diary of my season in 1969. Seattle Pilots were an expansion team made up of players who were all over the hill. Nobody wanted them, so that's how they got on this team. And to, the idea that you could write a book about a team that of leftover guys and you know holdovers and uh, you know uh, was a hard sell for a publisher. They they were sure. not too interested in the idea. So five thousand copies now. And X then, number of years later, we've, we're up to five million, aren't we? Yeah, well, I don't know if it's that many, but it could be, because the publishing companies don't count that well. Uh, <laughs> so what happened was that uh, right after the book came out, uh, the baseball commissioner, uh, Bowie the Ayatollah Kuhn, uh, tried, to, closest, tried to tell people that this was a bad book for baseball, which was a wonderful thing for him to do. Uh, because then everybody wanted to read the book that the baseball commissioner didn't want them to read. Uh, and then the publisher had to print another 5,000, then 50,000, then 500,000. And, you know, after about 34 years, it sold several million books. But anyway, the year after Ball Four came out, I, I wrote a follow-up to it, which I, I felt I had to dedicate to the baseball commissioner for This is, I'm glad you didn't take selling. it personally. I'm glad you didn't take it personally because he did such a wonderful job uh, selling the book for me, the first one. <laughs> well, I didn't okay. send him any royalties, however. Right, right, I'm, I'm, I was confident of that. But if, uh, here's a book that a publisher had low expectations of, you probably had low expectations of. Now, uh, 30 years later, this is a book that the, uh, that the New York Public Library said was one of the uh, books of the century and that uh, you are one of the 100 most important people in sports history because of, uh, because of Ball Four. Um, it just seemed like your book changed the way people wrote about sports. Well, all of that stuff uh, just sort of happened, and it was out of my... Uh, I had no intention of writing uh, any kind of a special book like that. I just, uh, I just had a great cast of characters and these were uh, players from other teams, and so they brought all their stories for the other, from the other teams. And so instead of it being a diary just about the Seattle Pilots, it was sort of a diary of, of Major League Baseball because all these guys were bringing in their stories from other teams. It's as if Major League Baseball put these guys on one team and said, well, they're not going to win any ball games, but if somebody writes a book, this will be a hell of a ball club. <laughs> And so I got lucky, really. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And, um, and, and these guys are hysterically funny and, and interesting characters. And, and all I had to do was, uh, you know, write it all down. I mean, they're the ones who made the book. And uh, it's because of them that, you know, uh, people are saying these things about the book. But I, I feel like almost detached from the process. Rick Riley, in one of his columns at, in Sports Illustrated, said that if he had one year left to live, he would read Ball Four again as often as he could. What, 
it's still it's it's still got legs. Why? Well, you know, I think uh, I, well, I do. I, I'll open it up once in a while just to bring back a memory and uh, and to get a laugh. And uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm not laughing at my writing. I'm, I'm laughing at these at these characters. I think there's something about a diary um, which which actually becomes more valuable over time because it captures a moment. And uh, the more time goes by. Uh, the more valuable that becomes, because it really gives you a glimpse into into what happened at a particular time. I, I've come to learn this about diaries now, because I, I see them, and I see that when they do these Civil War uh, programs on television, um, the most important uh, source material they have is the diaries of the soldiers. It's more important than the anthropologists and the sociologists and the historians, the soldiers who were in the fight uh, talking about what it was like for them, and you know, you see the power of Anne Frank's diary. Mm -hmm. um, if they could find a diary of an Inca slave, it would tell you more about that civilization than all the, you know, anthropologists you could put together. I mean, it's something about the immediacy of it, which is one of the reasons why diaries are are considered to be uh, the most valid um, memory of what happened in a particular event. That's why they're accepted in a court. You've got contemporaneous diaries of something that's. That's more valuable than anybody's memory. So, and and, and Roy, uh, your book *Be Sweet* is a type of a well, it's a memoir. But but you go back and look at things that happened in your childhood and, and what it means to be called Roy Blunt Jr. as opposed to just Roy Blunt. It, uh, it's, it, your 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 book does a little bit of what Jim's just talking about. Is is going. Well, I back. wish I had been taking notes uh, <laughs> when I was a child, but uh, I didn't think to. I really, it's hard to remember things, right? I just remember the most vivid things, which not necessarily the, which weren't the most pleasant things, in fact. Um, the things I never could, the things that just stuck me, stuck with me forever that I couldn't figure out. You know, the things that keep coming back to you. Why did my mother say that? You know, how can that have possibly been? You know, the things that keep nagging at you. Those are the things that I remembered. And, uh, you know, uh, and, so I was, and I was trying to get back at the, uh, my motive, you know, because when you write a book that's supposed to be funny, you go around and people interview you and say, well, how did you get to be funny? Were you always funny? And there's nothing in the world you can say that's just not hot. That's the worst straight, uh, you know, the worst setup question in the world. Is, uh, hang, hang on a second. Let me, <laughs> yeah, I got to cross out a question here. <laughs> how did you get to be funny? So I decided since I, since I hated that question so much, I would write a book uh, about it, sort of. And uh, so I went back into my childhood and my... Uh, and uh, in my mother's terrible, horrible, painful childhood, which I think is the roots of me, of my wanting to be funny. Also, my she taught me, made a writer out of me. At any rate, oh, don't, let's not go into all that right now. But uh, yeah, but I wish I had remember. I'm, the few times I've written things down, uh, you know, just in my life that happened, I, I go back and look at them. I find something I've written down, and I've completely changed it in my memory. And I'm always sort of startled that I uh, think I remember it exactly the way it was. So maybe it's a bad idea to take notes. I don't know, because uh, you, you have to find out that it wasn't as interesting as you, at the time as you've made it up in your head to be. But I think the thing, one thing about why Jim's book uh, was so good and stays good is that is, he was talking earlier today about capturing the way people talk and getting down exactly the way people talk. And uh, that sort of thing uh, always uh, lasts longer than, uh, than things more distant and abstract and literary. They, Huckleberry Finn was, you know, was, a, was this kid talking, and people said, this is just vulgar and awful. We, don't, we can't let our children read a kid talking, you know. And, uh, uh, but that's what's so great about it, is it captures this kid's voice and it mi mixes uh, the uh, colloquial in with, the, uh, in with uh, strong uh, uh, not uh, strong, literarily strong prose mixed in with great uh, vulgar talk is all, all the best stuff in American literature. Which pretty well defines ball four, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, so, and, and that we were pros at that. We had some professional, professional, professional uh, vulgar uh, talkers. Vulgar yeah. talkers, yeah. yes. Well, and, and you would you would write this stuff down as as soon as you could, right? Yeah. Make make sure you maintain yeah, your short-term memory. I found memory. that if I didn't write 
uh, if I didn't write the quotes down within five to ten minutes of it, I would forget exactly how it was phrased. And, and uh, you know, people have, everybody has their own unique way of speaking. And uh, if you don't capture it right away, it, it just sort of, it, you know, gets mixed up with other conversations and then you, you've forgotten it, you know. So I, I always had a notebook with me and I would write stuff down and sometimes people would be talking you know, in the bullpen, and I'd be two seats down, and I'd be just scribbling, writing down stuff, you know, and, and I'd run out of notebook paper, and then I'd be, um, you know, I'd reach for a bar coaster, you know, or a cocktail napkin, or mm. popcorn boxes, and the air sickness bags, and wherever I was, I was scribbling. I have all my original notes, they're in a big, and uh, the players, you know, they saw me taking notes, they knew I was writing something, but, uh, and after a while, it became so, um, it was like wallpaper after a while. They didn't even pay attention to it. Although once in a while they'd say something like, uh, you know, Bouton, keeping notes like that is worse than whispering. You know, <laughs> stuff like that, you know. Well, you know, George Plimpton was here a couple of years ago and he talked about how when he was working on Paper Lion, um, he kept a notebook in his helmet, in his football mm -hmm. helmet. And so things would get said on the sidelines at a practice or something, he'd pull this book out of his helmet to do this very thing, to, to get that uh, exactly how they said it. Yeah. Um, now, Roy, I've read a lot of great things on bar napkins, just, uh, you know, not even listening to people, but just, uh, I wish I had all the bar napkins that I wrote great stuff on. There's a whole, uh, somebody should put out a book of bar napkin. Uh, bar napkin right? notes? Bar napkin yeah. notes, yeah. That's a, uh, okay, I'll get back to you on that. Okay. All right, and now. And you know how to make a bar, bar napkin stay still? Tell me. You, you get some water or something and you touch your finger on each corner of the napkin and it will stay there. Because mine, you know, they move all yeah, over the place, exactly you know, right. with yeah, the side of your hand. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now, Roy, you had mentioned something about Huckleberry Finn. You've been compared to Mark Twain. Now, is that pressure? Oh, well, I don't know. Uh, but Mark Twain is um, uh, the, he sort of set the template of American uh, writing because he uh, combined American vernacular with, uh, with good writing. And um, it's interesting that nobody ever writes a parody of Mark Twain. Nobody ever writes a, you know, tries to m make fun of the way Mark Twain wrote because it would be like, um, uh, you know, doing an imitation of your father or something. You know, you, you already sound like Mark Twain. You can't. Uh, yeah, that's a good point because everybody imitates uh, Hemingway. Everybody does parodies yeah, right. of Hemingway yeah, yeah. or Faulkner or. Right. or yeah, but you're right. Nobody imitates. And Hemingway said that uh, Huckleberry Finn was the beginning of modern American literature. Well, and you said you said of Mark Twain that he could make America flinch before it laughed. <laughs> I, th I think you do the same thing a lot of times. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I certainly flinch before I get it done. <laughs> yeah, before you write it. Yeah. Uh, did you read a lot of Twain as a kid? Not a whole lot, I, I, but I read Huckberry Finn. Tom Sawyer is the one that kids read more, I guess. I read those, but I didn't, pre I was one of the biggest astonishments of my life was in graduate school when I saw that Huckberry Finn was regarded as a great novel and uh, um, you know, the great American novel, maybe. And it was a great, and then I heard people talking about Hitchcock movies as great things, and I thought, geez, you know, the stuff I like is great stuff, and uh, that was, uh, and then I, since then I've read lots of Mark Twain, and uh, I, what I love is, uh, I mean, Huckleberry Finn's a great book, but um, little shorter pieces he wrote. Uh, uh, he, he was out west with miners, and uh, it was all over the entire country. And he was, he was clearly taking notes uh, because he, had all, he has all these great stories that miners told him about blue jays and things. And, and uh, he gathered up all this great vernacular stuff in America, which I, one of the things I've loved to do in America is, is hear different people talk and try to catch it. And, uh, and uh, E.B. White said that the, a writer is the recording secretary of the universe. And uh, it's up to you to, if, some, if you don't write it down, it's going to get away. Um, I think that America's losing that a lot. I don't, just because I live in the Berkshires, I don't hear a whole lot of great figures of speech, for instance, you know, somehow. It's because you live by former ball players like Jim. Well, that would be, no, I live by people who... Uh, I live Culturally by, sophisticated yeah, people. Yeah, right. Go to the the theater, and the dance yeah. and all that. And, yeah. And they're, they're into European culture, you know. Uh, you know, uh, somebody told me that she was in... Uh, 
In uh, Minnesota, uh, moved to Minnesota, and uh, somebody said uh, to her politely, you know, some kind of party said, uh, "Well, how do you like?" She moved there from uh, from Georgia, and or from Mississippi actually. Moved from Mississippi to Minnesota, and a lady in Minnesota said to her, "Now, dear, uh, how do you like it here in Minnesota?" And she said, "Well." I like it, but there's not, not much culture here. And she said, what do you mean not much culture? We have the uh, opera, we have, you know, we have the symphony orchestra. And she said, no, not that kind of culture. I mean, <laughs> I mean American culture, which is uh, a whole different thing. It's, uh, it's uh, baseball is American culture, and, and sure. um, uh, fried chicken is American culture. And, uh, and that's the kind of things I've always preferred. Not that I Snow is American Spit on culture. the opera or anything. Hmm? No, snow is American culture, wouldn't you say? Boy, it sure is. I don't think, uh, Gary, yeah, I don't think you can be very funny about snow. <laughs> I've yet to find anything funny about snow. It's, I mean, you know, writing in it, writing your name in it is the only thing you can do is funny with snow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and there are creative ways to do that. Right. I've never heard of, I don't think you can write a joke in the snow, though. That, nobody can no. do that. No. No. Yeah, maybe if you came yeah. back later and finished yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, you could finish it. Did the punchline yeah, exactly. later. All the birds would be standing out there waiting to get the punchline. You can push somebody into a snowbank. That's pretty That's funny. funny, yeah. If That's it's the right funny. person. Yeah. If it's the right person. No, if, it, if a person's wearing a top hat and you push them in the snowbank and they die. That's funny. So they have to die before no, it's funny? No, they have funny? to have a top hat on. But uh, it's just, you know, it used to be you could knock it off with a snowball, but now since, since culture has gotten so drastic, they pretty much have to freeze to death, I think, for it to, <laughs> for it to count. <laughs> Jim, uh, in, your, uh, in one of the uh, editions of, of Ball Four, you quote your, your editor, uh, Lenny Schechter, saying that a guy could make a living just telling the truth. Was that, was that his encouragement to you to just uh, record the Seattle Pilots' time exactly as it happened? Yeah. You know, don't try to en enhance it. Or anything is that what he meant? Well, he, yeah, he he meant that. Uh, uh, yeah, he meant that it didn't. You don't have to embellish anything, and you don't have to make up anything. It's just, just the truth is is interesting enough, and uh, you know that statement becomes more and more true for me as time goes by. You know, it, it's out there today. A guy could make a living telling the truth, but how many people really tell the truth? You know, we got uh, this guy McNamara. Now, now he's willing to tell the truth. All these years later, you know, After Vietnam. We, need, we need a little truth back then. We don't want people telling us the truth in their memoirs. So I'm always waiting to see what somebody's going to fess up to, you know, when they're 93 years old and it's too late. All the things they've said and done have done their damage, and uh, now we're going to find out the truth. You know, let's yeah. tell the truth now, and that would be interesting. It'd be shocking, It'd be stunning. It'd be hard to people go, "Wow, oh my God!" Uh, <laughs> if if anybody really started to do that in public life, mm -hmm. but right now you have to wait for their memoirs. The Secretary of Defense said, "I love war. You know, I just kind of get into it, and uh, right. you know, you, I mean, you know, I know I shouldn't, but I really kind of like it. I mean, I don't want to sit here." <laughs> And, uh, you know, you get tired just sitting around Washington. I never really had a good war of my own. Things like that, you know. It would, uh, I could almost get behind that. Not this other <laughs> but, but, Jim, telling the truth, at least the way you told it in Ball Four, it didn't win you any friends. And, and, and as I recall, it was our own San Diego Padres Club who burned a copy of Ball Four and left the ashes in the, uh, in the clubhouse. Yes. Um, well, when, when the book came out, I was uh, pitching for Houston Astros at the time because the pilots had traded me toward the end of the season. And so now I was uh, traveling around the country with the, with the Houston Astros. And, of course, every town we went into, uh, it was a fresh story for that town, but it was definitely an old story for the team. You know, Benedict Arnold is here, or the next town would be Judas has arrived, or, you know, <laughs> what, the what social did, leper and my what teammates. Did Pete Rose, what did Pete Rose yell to you when you were on the mound? I was, I was pitching in uh, Cincinnati, and uh, I was on the mound, and Pete Rose is standing on the top step of the dugout, and he's screaming at the top of his lung. He's saying, F you, Shakespeare, and he's <laughs> screaming. And I, I started laughing because I thought, you know, hey, a literary reference from Pete Rose, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew? That, that was pretty good. 
And the yeah. funny, the, the, the ending to that story, now that was all the way back in 1970. Now I haven't seen Pete Rose, you know, up close, person to person, until two years ago. And I was sitting at a sports dinner, one of those things where they got about 25 guys they've invited. And I look over there and I see the name tag sitting next, the name tag next to me says Pete Rose. I say, oh, Pete Rose is going to be coming in here. And sure enough, he comes down the aisle and he sits down. He, he looks over, he sees my name tag. He takes a look at me. He sees it's me. And he says, I didn't even read your book. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, he remembered what he had hollered to me, and now here he was. Uh, he telling once, me about said, this book. once said in an interview that he'd never read a book. And somebody said, Well, Pete, you've written two. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or he could be like David Wells, who said he misquoted himself in, 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 his, in his own book. Uh, uh, actually, I, I have to ask uh, you something, Jim, about something you, you wrote in the 25th anniversary edition of, uh, of Ball Four. In the introduction, you said, uh, you know, all these people have still stop you and say, oh, you know, it was a great book, you know, my, my, it's the only reason my kids, you know, even read then. And uh, you said one mother said that uh, uh, she wanted to build a shrine to you because it was the only book that her son finished. Yeah. I have to ask you something. Was that my mom? <laughs> I think it was. It could have been. It could have been your. Mom. I, I, it could I, have been your mom. I, I, I think it was. Be but it was that, a lot of mom because, you know, when, when you're a kid. I mean, when I was a kid, I, I didn't like the idea of reading a book. They were so they were so big, you know, uh, these books. And um, but but Ball Four was was because it was in a diary and had just little bite-sized pieces, and it was funny. These guys were were very funny, these players, and so it was easy book for a kid to read, and you, you, could, you could get into it, and, and you could do a book report. It was a very heavily... I did several. Very heavily yeah. reported uh, book. <laughs> yes. Uh, and they were reading about people who were no more mature than they were. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. They could identify. That's right. And, and kids felt, gee, you know, I, I, you know that's right. I'm, I'm just as nuts. These guys are just as nuts as we are. And, uh, and in many respects, the players were, you know, 15-year-olds. In adult bodies, but the kids identified with that, you know, right away. Well, that's what I remember. It, it just reminded me of the way, you know, kids at my school talked and yeah. did, did things to each other. And yep. Roy, let me ask you a, 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 a question. A, back to be sweet for a second. You you make this statement: a story is like a sandwich. You know what it is. You can get a grip on it, but it can still be full of Velveeta. <laughs> Yeah. The, the, now, now, well, hold on, hold on. The truth is something that makes us wonder, what in the world is that? That's right, yeah. Well, I, what do you mean? Well, I mean that I get tired of people talking about great storytellers. Just because it's become such a cliche somehow. People always talk about, he's a great storyteller. And, and also they have storytelling conventions now, where people put on storytelling costumes. That just drives me crazy. I hate that. I grew up where people, in the course of explaining things or remembering things, would tell little stories. I mean, it's just part of the deal. But to objectify it and turn it into some kind of commodity, it just irritates me. And then the movie business developed this whole notion that the story had to have three acts and it had a certain arc of character. People had to learn something about themselves in the course of 90 minutes. And the, the whole thing of story, and people, you know, it drove me crazy that uh, people talked about story so much, which is, and I like a story, but the story, if, and you see all these movies being cranked out, which are just these art things, and they, it shifts gears after the first 20 pages and shifts gears again after the next 40 pages. Pretty predictable. Yeah, it's, just, it's, it's, it's so mechanical. And we, uh, go back to Mark Twain again. People talk about Mark Twain's a great storyteller, but he wrote these ramshackle, shapeless, crazy books, uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court is just insane. It's an amazing. The tone of it changes all the time, and all sorts of horrible things happen. And at any rate, it's and it's not any kind of arc of story. I think it's very uh, constricting to uh, to to talk about story all the time, and and uh, instead of just 
I don't know, whatever, just uh, trying to get at something strange and get at, because uh, when you do tell the truth, it is strange. And that's why people are startled by good books, is that, oh, this is not a book. This is, I don't know what that is. That's, I mean, I, mm -hmm. And, um, of course, it may be a bad book, too. But, uh, but good books usually do cause uh, some, some people not to like them and don't seem like real books. You know, they, that's not, you know, he's not writing like a writer. He's just like, that's just people. It's just people talking. Yeah. So I guess that's, have I addressed your question? <laughs> <laughs> addressed it, yes. Um, I but, addressed uh, it and mailed I, it off somewhere. What, no, no, no. I, I, I was just curious about the Velveeta. Oh, well, I, that's what I mean. Is that a, the che it's just a cheesy. Uh, Got it. Right. And, and cheap, cheesy story, whereas, uh, but it'll hold together. If it's got Velveeta, it'll, there's, a, there's your story, all right. It, it shifted gears at just the right time. But if it's full of good cheese, all crumbly uh, blue cheese, or it's going to uh, leak out and get all over you, and you think, oh, God, this is not a sandwich. What is this? That's, a, that's the kind of book I like. <laughs> I, I, I followed the arc of that. <clears throat> um, now, you did a screenplay with uh, uh, Bill Murray as the, yeah. as the principal. All right, I did. I've written two or three things uh, which have uh, put my children through uh, good ways through college and um, movie things. But the only one that was ever made was a movie I made with, uh, that Bill Murray brought me in to re rewrite a script that had already been written about a guy taking an elephant. He inherited an elephant from his father. Now, this believe is lar me, larger than life. Believe right? me, this was credible. Yeah, he inherits an it. elephant, and that's, that's a yeah. believable story, right? Okay. Yeah, and then he has to get it cross-country. Now, if you or I inherited an elephant, we would go to the Yellow Pages or something, and we would just say, you know, we would, find, we would ship it, you know. Yeah. But if you're going to make a movie out of getting an elephant somewhere, you have to do a lot of stupid things like, uh, I don't know, go, the first thing you do is go to a, a, you say, is there a zoo in town? And meanwhile, you're trying to keep hold of your elephant. And people say, yeah, there's a zoo down the road, and you find yourself at a petting zoo, which, you know, because you thought the zoo might help you, but you're in a petting zoo. And when you're making, filming in a petting zoo, you realize why the story about elephants not liking mice and being afraid of mice and little animals is true, because our elephant, who's a wonderful animal, was there in the petting zoo, and there were all these little animals running around, and the elephant, every now and then the elephant would just kick one up in the air, you know, and the elephant was just going like this, <laughs> all these little animals, and didn't want to step on them, and they're driving the elephant crazy, and um, there was, um, and there was, there was a bird that was supposed to come down, a dove, and land on Bill Murray's shoulder part of the scene. They had the dove wrangler there, you know, and all said, don't worry, the what, dove wrangler. Hold, hold, hold it, hold it. A dove wrangler? Yeah, you know, that's what the they call guy, him? Well, that's what I call it. <laughs> you know, the guy that handles the dove, the dove uh, person. Oh, the dove person. I like wrangler. I and just there didn't... was an owl over there, too. There was an owl in the scene, sort of sitting there like this, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, all of a sudden the owl passed out. The owl got dizzy. <laughs> You know, I didn't know that was possible. I didn't either. You'd think you could count on an owl, but yeah. the, owl, the, the, owl, so the, the owl guy was turning you know, so we had to take the owl out. Well, we can't do the owl. Go, right, go on without the owl. Come on. You didn't have a stand-in for the owl? No, we only had one owl. We had two doves, however. <laughs> one dove flew off somewhere, and they were chasing the dove. And the second dove, um, the whole... whole um, Back end of its, uh, the whole back end of the dove was defeathered somehow or another, and so the, so we had a, uh, and meanwhile we had a humane society guy who would run out into the scene every now and then, and they'd say, "We see a guy in a white shirt. What is that?" And he was saving little animals from the elephant. At any rate, and the dove, flew, and then the, he said, "Okay, what's wrong with the dove? How did the dove get like that?" And the dove guy said, "Well, it was a sexual thing last night with another dove." <laughs> With another I, dove, I thought right. maybe it was the owl. No, well, no, the owl, I don't think the owl was up to that. The <laughs> owl was it. Anyway, right. but the thing, what I want to say is that the, if we had just shot that, it would have been, that was much more interesting than the movie. Because there was no story there, but it got, there were all kinds of things happening, you know. And uh, Meanwhile, I had to keep the thinking of jive reasons why you would take an elephant Cross country by various uh, planes, trains, and automobiles to keep the uh, arc of the story going. But it was an interesting. Thing. Were you happy with how that worked out? No. Well, I uh, no. It was all right. There was the uh, Matthew McConaughey was. Brought, I had this great uh, anti uh, untypical 
unstereotypical truck driver I had made up, who was because he was a health food nut. You don't expect a truck driver to be a health food nut, do you? Anyway, but, uh, but I didn't like the way Matthew Mc Matthew McConaughey played him really straight, I mean really broadly and over the top and rednecky and uh, it, and that bothers me. And also, then they changed things at the end. It got too broad. There's some great moments between Bill and the and the elephant. There's some really nice moments. There's a great moment where the elephant is swimming. All of a sudden, she gets in the water. Well, I won't go into that. But so, as I, the uh, incidental little stuff was, which is always the stuff I've enjoyed in reading and in life, is more interesting than the the story. But well, you've got to have the story in order to tie the other thing. That That's true. And, and you've made a living out of writing about the unusual and the quirky and, and the, the things that, uh, that people just wouldn't even, wouldn't even see normally. Right. I'm thinking... Uh, I'm sorry. What? No, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I like no, that. No, no, thanks. No, uh, even the Sports Illustrated story you did on hitting triples. Triples, yeah. 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 I've Maybe. always liked the idea of taking something that people take for granted, like triples, I don't know. And just elephants. Elephants, elephants yeah. Right, yeah. Moving just elephants. See what, to, what you can do with it, yeah. Because if you just lay something like that down, things will gather, gather around it. And you just say, well, I don't know. I just like to, I just went to Barnes & Noble and started reading, going through uh, baseball books and looking for triple stuff and triple lore and I don't know. I, I like to do that kind of thing. I have to tell you my elephant story while I'm on the subject. <laughs> We were at the zoo in Washington, D.C. Right. This friend of mine and I, while well, uh, we were babysitting for his little girl, while our, our wives were at some sort of a conference, and we went to the zoo, and there was the uh, elephant house there, and I have a very good uh, elephant imitation, which I'll do for you. Ooh. I'd, I'd like to <laughs> so anyway. That's pretty good. <laughs> Hang on, do we, need to, do we need to change the windscreen on so this I, mic there? So I do my elephant number. And this big bull elephant comes out of the elephant house and comes lumbering down to the fence. And my friend looks at me and he says, I think you're engaged. <laughs> I used to be able to do a ca camel thing, but I literally blew out the entire upper register of my voice doing camel. You want to you try it just one time? See, it starts way up here. I can't do that part. But now I can't do the lower part. But the lower part is sort of like uh, somebody, gar I don't know, it's an amazing thing. It, it, I did a camel, went on a camel safari one time, and uh, the cam great thing about the camel is when you wake it up in the morning and you start poking it, and uh, it acts like it never heard of the notion that it was a beast of burden. What is this? What is this? You know, it's sort of... I'll, I'll work on it. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> We, you know, we've got about 20 minutes left. I know, so yeah. I'll try not to interrupt. Try, try to loosen, loosen those. <laughs> I don't know. That's you can have some of my water. Just the bottom part. This interview must be playing, playing havoc with your notes there. Yeah, huh? yeah I've, 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 pretty much, I've pretty much just tossed those out. Uh, uh, <laughs> Jim, with, uh, with Ball 4, something similar, it seems to me, happened with your latest book, Foul Ball, which talks about uh, trying to save a, a minor league ballpark yeah. in, in Massachusetts. Um, both those books, they've got a similar style. You know, you take a day-by-day -day kind of accounting of things. Um, and you're just trying to tell the truth of the events as yeah. they happen, because, as you've said, you can't make this stuff up. No. I read Foul Ball, no. and I was just amazed you at, can't at make some it of the up. things. Um, and yet both of your books actually changed some things, which I, I think is, is really interesting. Ball Four changed the way people wrote about sports because you took away the, the myths, you peeled back the veneer of, uh, of a very highly polished image of professional athletes. Well, they couldn't, they couldn't sell the milk and cookies anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, that's what changed, I guess. Well, in Foul Ball then, uh, even though it ends on kind of an unhappy note, now that it's been published, you've got some good news about this ballpark that, that you got voted against. Yeah, right? uh, just a, a little background. <clears throat> My partner and I had an idea to save this old ballpark in Pittsfield, Massachusetts that the people wanted, but the powerful handful of people, the politicians in town, didn't want. They wanted a new baseball stadium to be built in the center of town on property owned by the Berkshire Eagle newspaper property that turned out to be polluted, and the paper never told anybody about it, but that's, that's a long story. And um, I had access to uh, 
you know, in, in our attempt to do this, we were talking to politicians and city councilmen, and, and uh, there were some, some shocking things. For example, the uh, president of the city council, not the president, but one of the city council members told, told us that uh, the city council couldn't consider our proposal to, to, to save the old ballpark until they were released council members were released by Andy Mick, who was the publisher of the local newspaper. So we went to Andy Mick and we said, well, what about our proposal? I mean, we, you know, we got we, a good proposal for the city here. He says, it's not up to me, it's up to my boss in Denver, Colorado. Hmm. The Berkshire Eagle is one of these, uh, part of these uh, media news group chains, a chain of newspapers. So here were the people of Pittsfield, uh, the city councilman beholden to the local publisher and the publisher beholden to his boss. So their destiny, their baseball legacy is in the hands of a guy in Denver, Colorado. And that's what I figured, I better start taking notes here because this is, this is pretty unbelievable. And uh, summer ended and, uh, you know, we spent all summer long trying to, to uh, correct misinformation printed about us in the local newspaper. We were attacked by the newspaper calling us names, uh, distorting our proposal, Can making they call you stories up. And, no, they didn't say that, no. uh, but uh, just as bad. And it was, uh, you know, as my partner Chip said about the, the newspaper, it was like living in Russia and having Pravda against you. Mm. Um, and so I, I talked about this in the book. And, and uh, at the end of the summer, the Parks Commission voted unanimously to deny us a lease on Wakona Park because uh, our plan would have put a stake in the heart of the new stadium. And they, so they put a new stadium guy in the old ballpark to keep that new stadium hope alive. <clears throat> and so I wrote about this. But it was such a, uh, <clears throat> such a revealing uh, story about the, the politicians in town and, uh, and the power brokers that uh, what it did was it, uh, you know, it, it took them off the board. It marginalized them. It, it just took their power away as sometimes, uh, you know, humiliation and shame can, can do. Or the truth. Uh, the truth, exactly. Speak truth to power. And um, so the new administration that just got voted in New mayor, new city council, new parks commissioners. As soon as they were elected, the mayor called up and he said, what would it take to get you guys to come back to town with your original proposal to save the old ballpark? And we said, well, if we get invited by the government, the parks commissioners, everybody, uh, a warm welcome, we'll, we'll come back. And that's exactly what they did. Because we knew we had all the people already behind us, and now we have the government. And so, uh, so you're my, back in business. Yeah, my partner said to me, you know, if, if it hadn't been for the book, and, and if the problems with Pittsfield weren't so graphically laid out, uh, they wouldn't have made that kind of change because Pittsfield has been run like that for many, many years, but now they could no longer do that. And, and this is one of the things I say to journalism school, uh, schools when I speak to kids at journalism, I say you can, you can really have a, a, you know, an impact. Words, words are, are powerful, you know, and you can, you can change things with words. And, uh, Particularly if you, uh, I mean, if you're just starting out, you know, keep a diary of, uh, of, of local small town politics. If, if it's done well enough, uh, it can speak for many communities around the country. And, uh, you know, you'll get inside of some sort of adventure, maybe uh, has to do with a the movie theater or zoning or whatever it is. But people are always interesting. They're always fascinating. And if you really capture them, uh, it'll be very readable. And it may actually do some good. Change some things. Uh, Roy, I, I want to ask you about uh, one of the first stories you wrote. Your first baseball story was about Willie Mays, wasn't it? Uh, maybe it was, yeah. One very, very early on, anyway, yeah. And so, so you've written about Willie Mays, all the major sports. You've covered Super Bowls. You wrote a book about the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, but you have also covered chess yeah. matches and possum shows. Yeah, I, that's the sort of thing I like to do, you know, there was... Uh, well, wait a second, there was a Super Bowl in there and all that sort of stuff. Which, which is the thing you like to do, the possum shows? And possum the, shows and, the, yeah, and, the, and the things like match. the oldest living lifeguard and that's the sort of thing I like to do. They were always trying to get me to go, you know, the American League West playoffs or something. And I said, you know, watch that on television, but you can't watch uh, a possum show on television. No, no I, I, yeah. I never have. There okay. is a dearth of possum shows, I've noticed. I know, yeah. Uh, but with it's cable? It's not commercial. Yeah, uh, there's with a cable, channel. Probably a possum channel. The possum channel, the possum I, think, channel yeah. I think, is... Uh... There, there was a guy who... Uh, you may have seen Eat More Possum uh, yeah. uh, bumper stickers. He started that guy, Basil uh, somebody, down in Clanton, Alabama. 
and I went down there, and my and my then wife went down with me, and uh, she um, got to be Miss Possum, Miss Possum International, because she no was from, way she she was from out of town. Well, the girl wow. who was going to be Miss Possum uh, had a date that night and couldn't come. <laughs> so, uh, but this she was, was the only female from, left. We or? were from uh, up north at the time. Uh, John got to be Miss Possum International, which was even better. What an honor! Yeah, but and and, and I became a possum judge. They had all these possums. All you haven't never seen a pretty possum, probably, but they had washed them their tails with babo and uh, fluffed them all up. And uh, really, yeah, they washed them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Did they have them do tricks. They're going to enter a dirty possum in a <laughs> show. Come on. <laughs> no, they didn't do tricks, but they, uh, you know, they were. Uh, and and Miss Possum, they also told us about. The regular Miss Possum, and uh, you were judged. I didn't get to judge Miss Possum, but they said uh, Miss Possum is judged on charm, for one thing, and that is judged by how she holds the possum, which is, uh, you know, you have to hold the possum in there, yeah. How do you hold the possum? Yes, well, you yeah, hold it, by it, the it, tail, because it's always trying to get away. So you're <laughs> <trying to> hold. <laughs> but you, and it's hard to do that charmingly, I guess. So it's, it's, yeah. Anyway, I like doing sort of Americana sort of stuff. And, right. and doing things that everybody else wasn't trying to cover at the same time. And and so why did a uh, a golf PR guy punch you? I don't know. I was with uh, it was at this golf tournament in uh, Florida somewhere, and I was with Reggie Jackson. I was doing a story about Reggie Jackson, and uh, and Fran Healy was there, and um, I don't know. And of course Reggie. Uh, we, he wanted to go to this golf tournament, so we went. And of course Reggie decided he'd just walk through the golf tournament. You know. And uh, I walked with him, you know. So we were walking all out on the walking along with the golfers and things, which I always like to work in close, you know. So uh, um, I just did it, and then came back to the press room, and this then the PR guy was just furious at me, you know, and uh, tried to take my beer away from me. I, you know, taken a press beer and uh, said I didn't have a credential to drink that beer, and I so I got mad and flashed some, and he hit me. And so I, you know, I was, and I grabbed him and chased him around. <laughs> but I mean, it was not the life of a sports writer. Not usually the way I act out. <laughs> so they didn't say anything about Reggie no, see, he doing couldn't, the he same couldn't say thing. About Reggie, right. But since I was saying they couldn't hit Reggie, you know, yeah. and, you know, but hit the writer. Hit, yeah, hit the writer. You know. That's a classic. Shoot the messenger. Yeah, blame the messenger. You know. Yeah. yeah. Right. I didn't mind him hitting me, but taking, trying to get me to surrender my beer for, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, on grounds of not being professional was uh, <laughs> in, inexcusable. Yeah. You know, uh, Jim Roy talks about following around Reggie Jackson. What did you think of sports writers when you were an athlete? Uh, well, not that you're not an athlete now, but no. I mean when you were a professional athlete. I, I, I thought it was great fun to get your name in the papers and your, your picture in there and you know, that was to me, that was part of the fun of being in the big leagues. Somebody would quote you and uh, they'd, they'd come over to your locker and ask you, you know, this or that. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid growing up, you know, dreaming once in a while about maybe playing in the big leagues or what must that be like. And, uh, you know, that was part of the fun of it. You'd be a star. You know, you'd, uh, you know, you'd, you'd get a headline with your name in it if you did something really special. So I, I always saw sports writers as, you know, part of the... F Part of the fun of it. So they weren't the enemy. No, no, they were not the enemy. And but, but most of the players uh, saw the writers as an annoyance. Mm -hmm. uh, they were sort of interfering with their concentration or their wanting to play baseball. Or they were nosy, you know. Um, so that if you had a good relationship with writers, then you were suspect also. Uh, and if you were seen yeah. talking to a writer in front of your locker. Uh, for a little too long, one of the veteran players would walk by and, <laughs> and, and give you this shot, which meant you're, you know, wrap it up, zip it up, you know, yeah. don't be talking to these writers. Um, when, when you started out, Roy, you started writing sports even in uh, high school, didn't you? Right I on? did in high school, yeah, but then I didn't for a while, but then I started again at Sports Illustrated. You had a sports scholarship? Sports writing scholarship oh, yeah, at did, Vanderbilt? Yeah, the Grantland Rice Memorial Sports Writing Scholarship, which uh, was a great thing. At the time, it was a uh, full ride uh, scholarship to four years at Vanderbilt and also a summer job. And I had written some sports in high school uh, for a local paper. And, but it was a great deal. And, uh, 
but then when, when I was in college, I got interested in other things and, uh, to write about and uh, sort of got away from sports writing until the Sports Illustrated job came up. And uh, so I got back into it, and uh, I'm glad I did. I didn't, but after, I didn't want to just write sports, so after seven years there, I went off and started freelancing. Wrote about possums. Wrote about possums, yeah. But I mean, I, I wanted to write about, a, you know, to get off into. I always, I've been, uh, one reason I keep moving, doing so many different things is I don't want to get stuck anywhere. You know, I don't want to get stuck where they tell you, okay, you got to go cover harness racing now. Not that there's anything wrong with harness racing, but, you know, and you can't afford to say no. I always wanted to be able to go somewhere else. Because I've had so many magazines fail from under me, you know, and uh, it's good to have something else. To, to go to. It's, it's tricky to be a freelance writer, and uh, so I always kept a lot of uh, hand, fingers in a lot of pots. Is that it? No, that's the it's, wrong it's, it's, it's Fingers a, in a lot of pies, pots in a lot of, uh, how does that go? Possums. Yeah, yeah. Pots, yeah, possums in a lot of pots. Um, you had a teacher in 10th grade, Roy, who, as you say, took note of my peculiar, peculiarities and suggested that you become a writer. And uh, now, what what were those peculiarities? Uh, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I would just, I would write peculiar, uh, you know, when you had to write what I did last summer or something, mm -hmm. I would, I didn't like the assigned topic. You just created your own then? I would write about the pencil that I was using or something, you know, it's sort of postmodern actually. <laughs> you were postmodern when yeah, it was pre-modern. it wasn't cool, yeah. Right. yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't know, and I, she liked the thing, and I, but I had never thought about being a writer. I really wanted to be a ball player until I realized I was not good at it, which was a problem. Um, I was going to be a three-sport immortal, actually, but I gradually died out in sport after sport. And uh, so then I started writing, and, uh, and I really liked that because I've always liked words and just playing around with language. And uh, I think that it's good to be a kind of word nerd, to be a, you know, like a computer nerd, to be a writer, to like to just endlessly tinker with uh, with words is uh, I've always uh, my father used to would be down in the heart down in the basement going through all he had all these shelves of nails and nuts and bolts bolts uh -huh. and little, little widgets and things that he was all, the only time he was really seemed to be all that happy around the house was when he'd go downstairs and whistle and, and go scratch through all of his little uh, hardware and uh, and that's I sort of like words the way he liked nails well, let's, let's uh, address uh, uh, just finally here, we've got some aspiring writers in our audience and viewers. Jim, you've said that you're most comfortable writing where you kind of speak it. And then, you know, you're, if you can say it out loud, then yeah. you're comfortable with how that looks on the page. Yeah. It, would that be a type of advice you would give to, uh, uh, to young writers now? Say out loud whatever it is you're writing. Well, I, I think if they if if they're if they're searching for a way to you know to express themselves or to uh, to write or find a way to do it. I mean, this is just how I learned it, and I'm sure there's there are better ways. But once you start doing something a certain way and you have uh, you know any kind of success with it at all, uh, the tendency is to just go back in and you know do the next thing that way. And so uh, the way I wrote Ball Four was I didn't really write it, uh, although I wrote all these notes, so I had these notes. But at the end of the day, I would spread the notes out on the bed and talk the notes into the tape recorder. And the tapes would then be transcribed and typed up, and carbon copies were made. And the book was really edited by Schechter and myself from the transcribed tapes, uh, crossing out stuff on these pages and stuff. So I, I mean, that's how I, I learned to to write that way, and so everything I've written since then, uh, sometimes I use a tape recorder, sometimes I won't, but even if I'm scribbling notes longhand, uh, and I sometimes will sit there and write, sometimes I'll, I'll use Ernest Hemingway's system. He used to, he used to put a, um, a legal pad up on the mantel, and he would walk around the room, and then he'd walk, go over there and he'd, he'd write, standing up on the legal pad, and then he'd walk around a little bit. And, and I do that sometimes too, just to sort of, Get the blood flowing, and you know, get your get out of your you know your head, and, and start thinking about. So sometimes I'll do that, but ultimately, once I put it on the computer, um, 
when I'm shaping the sentence or the paragraph, I say it out loud. I, I mumble it to myself because I have to hear it in my ear. It has to sound right to me, uh, not look right to me, but it has to sound right. So I, I end up saying it. And the other tip that I have is that I can't uh, write when I'm wearing underwear. I don't know why this is, but I, I feel, I feel. No, no, wait a second, Roy. You just nodded there. You know exactly. what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm not doing that. I feel. I, in fact, have given it up all together. <laughs> I can't even talk to a crowd like this. Oh. <laughs> but I feel, I feel constricted. I feel like, you know, that I, I, I need to be more free, and and I discovered this when I was. When Schechter and I were editing Ball Four at the very at the very last, I would go to his apartment in New York City, and we would spend all day long and into the evening, you know, going over every sentence and polishing it and fixing it and and stuff. And I couldn't sit there all that time. So what I did was I would take my pants off and sit there in my boxer shorts. In those days, we had those silk uh, boxer shorts, and that was comfortable to to sit there and write. Now I I just wear some floppy old sort of a pants and with, but I remember I would walk into Schechter's Whatever apartment. Works, man. I would walk into Schechter's apartment, and one night I walked in and he says, "Okay, Bouton, take your pants off and let's get to work." <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you writers and editors had a had a good relationship. All right, Roy, but the point is, the point is, whatever works for you. You know, try different things. Writers should try different ways of putting down the first draft or scribbling or talking or walking around or wearing certain clothes or writing at certain times of the day. I mean, because everybody's, you know, different and you'll find something that works for you. Roy, we've got just a couple seconds left. Can you give these folks some advice? Well, I, I was just thinking that uh, this, uh, not, this is not, nowhere near as titillating as the underwear thing, but. Uh, <laughs> I, the other day I was writing something and I was just all bogged down in it and, and so I printed a bunch of it out and um, then I turned off the computer and the next day I noticed that I had erased all that stuff I'd printed out and I was like, this is like 15 pages, I think, oh I gotta put this stuff back in here. But it turned out that in typing it again, it, I got going again, you know, because I rewrote it just, and I realized how lazy I've gotten with the computer because it used to be the old days of the typewriter. You know, you had to type several complete drafts, you know, and you'd take it off and you'd write on it a little bit and scribble on it and then have to retype the whole page. The more, you know, you've got to keep your fingers moving. Uh, I'm really restless, too. I get up and walk around and can't sit still. But uh, I think that I, don't just fall back too much on the computer and moving blocks of text around. You've got to get, get your head down in there again and rewrite, just redo it over and over and over. And, so, it, you know, whatever that Yates line is, we must labor as a, for hours sometimes to make it seem like but a moment's thought. You know, the more you work on it, the quicker it goes. Uh, Mark Twain talked about the, the, right, oh, uh, the right word being electrically prompt. Electrically prompt. You know, it just jumps like a spark. And uh, he also said the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. And you have, you have to keep trying to find the lightning. But you don't find it just by, you know, you find it by, God damn, there's got to be some lightning in this. You know, you have, it's like keep herding a room full of snakes together writing, I find. But if you can get them going the same lines, then all of a sudden you, people say, good Lord, there's a, a whole car, uh, line of snakes going to the line. And, uh, and you think, oh yeah, look at those snakes, how'd they get like that? And you, yeah, that's the way it ought to be done. Roy Blunt Jr., Jim Bouton, a couple of national treasures in my view. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. This is great. Thank you, Jim. Way to go, man. <laughs>